Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher, and we're happy to have you. Um, It is October 15th, 2019, just celebrated a birthday. So I had a good weekend. I was actually on a business trip and uh, also saw family up in Oregon in the the Seattle area for business. So it's been a really good week. Um, So now I'm ready, heading back into full work mode. I actually leave for Colorado this week uh, and in between doing audits. So I'm, I'm very busy this month. I've got all kinds of of trips. I was up north earlier in the month uh, just for business as well. So it's been a a really traveling month so far. So what we want to talk about today, or I should say my topic focus, is going back to my modifier spotlight. And today the modifier spotlight is on the 22 modifier. So this is a tough modifier because this is for increased procedural services and it's considered magic in some instances and warrants more reimbursements from payers if you perform the uh, correct application of it. And it can fall into a black hole if not executed correctly. And it does take some due diligence and work on the part of the coder and, and the biller. You'll need to work together to make this work. And I'm also going to include a 22 modifier collection letter because I'm going to give you a little tip on sometimes how it works a little bit better to use that modifier. And I'll put it on part of my blog this week. So, uh, and you can use it as part of your revenue cycle management toolkit. So take a look at that uh, before Friday and it'll be up and you can use that. Uh, There's also a lot of conferences, seminars, and even some of you are coming back from a vacation and are on information overload as you head back to work. That's some of the feedback I've been getting this week. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips on just how to handle all of that and not to feel overwhelmed and how you can be efficient and get caught up at work. So uh, I've had to take some of the advice of my own myself. So uh, this is where hopefully we can both help each other on this. Um, I'm really getting into when I say audit mode, I have an ongoing several clients that I do audits for them daily basis, monthly, weekly, um, you know, quarterly. And, uh, and I actually love auditing, I really do, because it just lets me dive into all kinds of different things, not just uh, E&M services, but also certain uh, procedures. And so between cardio and ortho, and actually now I'm breaking into podiatry, and also uh, partly um, infusion therapy, and there's all kinds of different specialties that I'm asked to look at. And it's just interesting when you see this, the component levels and uh, some of the things that uh, physicians are out there doing and uh, hopefully making sure that they're compliant. But we really perform a lot of audits. And one thing that's nice is that uh, I can do that while I'm traveling on the road. Uh, Laptops are great, but also um, it's nice to be local and to be able to uh, access things remotely so that I can stay uh, in California for a while. There was a time, I don't know if some of you knew this about me, but I've been in the industry a long time. Actually, if you ever belong to LinkedIn, you'll see me up there. I know a lot of you connect with me on uh, LinkedIn. That is a business social media site. But uh, and thank you for everybody who, you know, congratulated me. One of the things that that popped up was my 30 year anniversary for Terry Fletcher Consulting. So that was nice. It was October 2nd uh, and 1989. <laughs> and so that was just such a, a nice milestone for me to, to hit 30 years. You actually when you hear yourself say that out loud, I mean, 30 years in business it's a little bit daunting. You sit there and say, well, wait a minute, I, I'm not over 45. How did that happen? Um, yeah, I've stuck there for a couple of years. But uh, it just it's crazy just to think that you can last in the industry that is forever growing and expanding. And uh, it's it's nice when you get a second wind, you know, 10 years ago in your business where it's it's this, you know, when you're a consultant, it's up and down. And so uh, it's it's mostly been up. I've been very fortunate in my business and and just what I've done over the years. But a long time ago, when I first started, I traveled almost 200 days a year. And that was when my daughter was very small. And uh, it was it was tough. 
But you know what, now that she's an adult, and she's so well adjusted, high school teacher, just, you know, a great I still call her a kid at 24 years old. But um, it's nice now that my travel has really scaled back. Now I'm only traveling about once or twice a month, um, maybe about five times a quarter, and I'm able to do more things locally. So but I still like to get out. I mean, again, this week month has been a, a traveling month. I'll be on the road this month, it looks like almost uh, 14 days. So that's quite a bit for me. So let's get started kind of rambling on there a little bit. Um, I love podcasting because you can just kind of talk about anything and I do try to keep it business, but sometimes it's nice just to be able to have a conversation. So first, today's CodeCast is also brought to you by Black Mirror, a Netflix original series now streaming on netflix.com forward slash Black Mirror. And Victoria Selman, number one best-selling author on Amazon and New York Times for her novel Blood for Blood and in her third season of Crime Girl Gang, True Crime Podcast. I actually read the Blood for Blood. It's actually a really not good book. I like it. I read a uh, recent publication on it. Somebody on my Facebook page personally, uh, one of my best friends, Dina, she said, I, she put out a challenge and everybody puts these challenges to you like the, you know, ice bucket challenge, all that thing. She put a challenge for literacy, which is she knows is a big platform for me. A lot of things I do from a philanthropic uh, standpoint on literacy, mostly in adults. I know a lot of people focus on kids, but I think there's a lot of adults that, that need that help. And um, I had an opportunity to read a book by Tammy Hogue, who's a, a female author and it was called ashes to ashes and she also had dust to dust scariest book I ever read in my life I was I mean I had to read it with the lights on a couple of times I had to walk around my house and I love scary stuff like that I don't like gory I like scary there's a difference and so uh, it was it was a scary thing but just looking at some of these uh, authors that now follow me on social media. And uh, since I'm also an author and a writer myself, mostly with uh, publications that I have to do for work, like my peripheral cardiology coder, but I'm also getting into to writing some um, true crime things. So I've started doing that. So that's just something that a little bit of a, a side creativity jaunt there. So it's just fun to when you get uh, actual authors who are on the, the t New York Times bestseller, Amazon bestseller that uh, come out and sponsor your podcast. So thank you for that. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is the 22 modifier. And let me just kind of preface it that when you get into talking about certain modifiers, I know there are some ways that you use them and they're very CPT book driven. This is the 22 modifier is also Medicare driven. And uh, there's a couple of things that you have to keep in mind when you use the 22 modifier, that it's not black and white, there are circumstances that you will have to adjust your thought process when you're looking at your uh, 22 modifier. And so we want to make sure that if you're going to use it, that you use it correctly, or it can be considered a waste of time. And I don't want you to waste your time. So the one thing with the 22 modifier, and this is kind of a controversial thing to say, but a lot of people believe or a lot of coders and billers believe that you can use it on anything. First, you can't use it on ENM codes. Uh, you can't use it on your visit codes. And it's also a challenge when you try to use it for coding anything that's diagnostic. I rarely use it in cardiology, and you know that's one of my number one specialties. Um, but do I use it in general surgery, in orthopedic surgery, and urology surgery? Hear what I'm saying? surgery, surgery? Yes, I do. And so um, it's a very helpful modifier when you're dealing with surgical services. And so let's just take a look. Here's a couple of examples, and hopefully this will give you some insight on how to use it. So here's one. So the surgeon performed an uh, acetabular fracture, so pelvic, 27254, and it took him great detail longer, a great deal till longer than usual. Um, owing to the patient's obesity, he wants to use a 22 modifier for increased procedural services, and he wants to get paid for extra time. So what is it that you need to give to, and it's a Medicare patient, give to Medicare as you're reporting it, to make sure that you can get extra money, and how much do you want? So first of all, there's a couple of steps you need to take, and this is where the coders need to work with the billers. So CMS, you have to make sure, first of all, they agree with your doctor that they spent more than the usual amount of time. So there's a physician fee schedule file at the CMS website. And when you go to that website and find the CY2019 PFS, that's physician fee schedule, proposed rule physician time, and it's a zip file. I'll give you the website in a second. 
Open that, open the spreadsheet and look for 27254. In column E, you'll find the median operation time for the procedure. And in this case, it's 137 minutes. I don't know if you realized you could do that. So now if your surgeon's time exceeded that, and he can describe how the patient's obesity required the extra time, then you may be justified in the notes to allow the 22 modifier. But time is not your only factor here. So CMS will also take into account when a case may be more difficult and require additional physician skill or effort due to the severity of the patient's condition. They also comment in CPT, technical difficulty of the procedure, or if there's unusual anatomy of the patient. So I try to tell my providers to clearly document in measurable terms how much more work was required. So for obesity, the top of the note should say something like the patient's obese body habits 360 pounds, BMI of 46, increase the time to explore the abdomen due to the presence of visceral fat and scar tissue. This part of the procedure took an extra hour. And so that actually gives you more spe specificity in the note and the better chances of gaining additional payment. Other conditions may call for a 22 modifier, but complexity due to previous surgery, that was one, at the same site or encountered during the approach, you could have, you know, scar tissue and adhesions, that's a big deal for the 22 modifier. There could be extensive disease, uh, extensive bleeding, and also for maybe for your OB-GYN specialty obstetricians, multiple births may also qualify. Now, be aware that some carriers will want a letter with the claim laying out the circumstances calling for the extra procedure and time. And some may deny these claims just as a matter of course and ask for an additional uh, documentation request. That's the ADR. And then Medicare allows each MAC carrier uh, to determine the payment for these claims upon their review. So which is why whenever a claim is submitted with the 22 modifier, there is an ADR so they can review whether the 22 modifier was appropriate and how much extra that they want to pay. And also you want to, when you're looking at this, data is really the key here. And so one of the things that came up recently when, it when we talked about modifiers, um, I was talking on a forum for Decision Health and they, they talk about when you're dealing with your letter, and this is also, they kind of pulled one of my letters as well. Your letter should clearly refer to key data, okay, as the date of service, policy number, mention the operative note that will be attached, and restate the case for extra payment. So, for example, let's look at shoulders. I probably put a 22 modifier on shoulders more often than not, the 23472, because total shoulder replacement, there's so much additional work that I don't believe the fee schedule covers and additional time that is not part of the, the actual time that's listed in the work file. So you might want to say something to the effect, if this is accurate, extensive back table work to prepare the bone graft, correcting serious and numerous humeral and glenoid defects with mental metal mesh and cerclage wires that provide the same intensity as fixing a fracture, a time consuming compression grafting, followed by cementing. And it's helpful if you put much time, how much time is in there. And you should also calculate the overage based on the median time. So and request that percentage as an elevation of the charge. So if a, you know, if you have a certain amount of time, and then you're more than half, again, that time, that's where that uh, specific information is going to be really helpful. Also, the source for that, just so you have it, is when you're looking at the 22 modifier the, in the proposed rule. So it's a zip file, and you go to cms.gov forward slash Medicare forward slash Medicare uh, dash fee dash four dash service dash payment forward slash physician fee schedule forward slash downloads. And again, you go CY2019 PFS and PRM physician time. So you'll find it up there. You just have to look for it. And it's proposed rule physician time. But that file alone can be really helpful because you're now the one saying, hey, I've done my homework on this. And this is how I can get that 22 modifier reimbursed. Now the other way, and this is something that's a little tip, if you have trouble on the front end, what I try to get practices to do, and this happens every once in a while, not just orthopedic, but other uh, services where you just have a certain payer, I won't, won't call them out, Humana, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, that basically just hate the 22 modifier. And so what we try to do is on the back end, 
Uh, if they don't pay it extra, they just pay the fee schedule. We send a modifier 22 letter. And again, I'll put this on my blog this week. And it's something to the effect that says, Dear Insurance Company Rep. And it's also accompanied with a reconsideration form if it's Medicare. Please find and close a copy of our claim dated. We were paid our contracted rate of, you're also going to include a copy of your ELB. But after further internal review, we have determined that the claim was an increased procedural service and make sure you reference your CPT book current year. We put in there, this procedure was scheduled for blank hours, uh, but actually took blank hours. And the CY file says it should take this file, this amount of time. The technical difficulty of this procedure was such that it required increased intensity time and increased mental effort on behalf of the physician. And then we talk about the attached op report, Let's check out the highlighted section. And I've also included the copy of the 2019 CPT book, Appendix A, modifier section to describe the 22 modifier. Then I put in a specific sentence. We are respectfully requesting additional reimbursement of, and your amounts are going to fluctuate based on time and based on uh, difficulty. I try to get at least half the fee schedule, so half of the allowable, and then say to reflect the more appropriate reimbursement for this service. And then obviously with your attachments, and then let me know if you have any questions. But that's something that can be very helpful, helpful if you do it on the back end, because at that point, uh, you've already been paid, so you don't have to worry about cash flow. And now you basically are saying, I just want extra money based on this documentation and how difficult it was for our physician. So sometimes doing it on the back end can be a little bit better. Okay, so now I want to get to my coding question. And this comes from one of my uh, Mexico City listeners to the podcast who said, Terry, I hope you can say this on the podcast because we are having trouble. We are getting denials for pre-op visits and we use 99211 and 99212. Can you tell us when a pre-op is appropriate and when we can bill for it and get paid? We're a general surgery office. Okay, pre-ops are tough because a pre-op is part of a global surgery package per se. The day of or the day before surgery and the 90 days out is a global 90 day surgery. So let's just say the patient's coming in for this quote unquote pre-op and it's just to give them their forms, their disability handouts, a brochure on home care, um, their scripts afterwards, their prescriptions. And basically they're just coming in and answering any other you know last minute questions they have. That's not a billable service. And I see a lot of practices billing for that. What a pre-op that is billable can be, it's, it's a pre-clearance for, sur for a surgery. And so the only time you would actually bill for it is let's say the patient is scheduled to have a hernia repair since you're a general surgery office, but the patient's coming in and they've got an upper respiratory infection or a the flu or the a cold and your doctor needs to listen to their lungs because they're not going to want to put them under any kind of anesthesia if they've got a cold because that could uh, interrupt breathing issues. That would be a pre-op. Or let's say the patient is concerned that they may not want to have surgery because they went on the internet and found something else that they thought could be a better, you know, treatment plan instead of the surgery. So sometimes they'll come in on their scheduled pre-op encounter and uh, try to talk themselves out of surgery. And if your physician has to have a conversation and go over everything again on why this is a good idea, then that may be an argument for it. But a standard patient, just a regular routine patient coming in to pick up paperwork and their prescriptions and maybe their aftercare um, paperwork that is not considered billable. So be careful with pre-ops. Also, I mentioned a day of or day before, there's some payers and I'll call out Blue Shield, they're a big one, that even if it's up to a week before, they're like, we don't pay for pre-ops, that's part of the global. So know what your commercial contracts say, but uh, also be aware that it has to be medically necessary. You can't create a visit just because the patient is coming in and having you fill out paperwork. So keep that in mind. Our coding question was brought to you today by Sirius XM Radio, Dr. Radio Channel 110. Check it out live and on demand. Download the Sirius XM app today. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I talked about information overload. And I know some of you are coming back to work after maybe an AAPC conference or a vacation or sick leave, and you immediately feel overwhelmed. Your email inbox has, you know, 500 unread, me unread messages, if you're anything like me. Um, your internal mailbox is full, and maybe your boss welcomes you back with 
tasks that are, of course, high priority. And you need to find a way to sort through the data quickly and efficiently to make up for lost time. So data can be verbal, auditory, or in writing. It can be physical or digital. It doesn't matter how it comes in. Too much of it can be overwhelming and very stressful. And I don't want you heading towards burnout, especially uh, when you try to get away to be refreshed or you went to a learning experience at a conference. So how do you overcome it to make sure you can catch up and get tasks done? So first of all, do what we call a mind dump. Clear your mind by creating a big list of everything floating around in your head. Once on paper, then you can prioritize the items into buckets. Things to do today, things to delegate, things to do this week, and things to drop. Uh, you should see the lists that I have everywhere. And it's very helpful just so you have it down. And I get very excited when I remember to do these lists, not just on paper, but I also have a notebook in my phone, because then I'll look back at it. And I text myself all the time, just things I need to remember. And I'll look and go, Oh, that's right, I need to stop by on my way home and do that. And then follow the five minute rule. If you have a lot of little tasks, designate an hour a day to plow through items that will take just a few minutes, such as quick emails, phone calls, checking on a claim, uh, maybe a website for status, quick questions for coworkers, etc. But that should be just dedicated to that, those uh, easy tasks. And then try to clump together similar tasks. So if you have several claims or coding issues with one insurance company, take care of them with one phone call. Many customer service reps will help you more than with one claim. Uh, I know that can be very helpful. They didn't used to do that, but they do that now. And one of the biggest things you can get into trouble with, and probably this is one of the worst things for me, try not to multitask. Stick with what you're doing without interruption, and that means put your phone away. Put it on silent, put it in a drawer, close your office door if you need to, and focus on a difficult task. Don't let small interruptions get you sidetracked, and your phone is a big one. And do most your most dreaded task first. So we start our days with the most energy and focus, and we usually have some caffeine going on. So do the task you've been dreading for the most first thing in the morning. You'll be glad you got it out of the way when it's completed. You'll be able to move on with your day, and you'll be in a much better mood as well. Um, don't spend too much time on menial tasks. So give decisions the appropriate time they're worth. A quick decision shouldn't take hours away from your day. Make important decisions at the beginning of the day when you're the most clear-headed. And then take breaks, a 15 minute break to rock, walk around the building or go outside or listen to music can do wonders for your brain. I think I talked recently about a window break, just walk to the window if you can't get outside and look outside. Your employer wants you to be productive. So always take advantage of breaks, you're entitled to a 15 minute break in an eight hour day plus a lunch break. And then allow yourself to daydream. You might think I'm being silly here, but our minds cannot stay in one gear all day long. The daydreaming mode acts as an, uh, basically a, a neutral reset button and replenishes some of the glucose you use up in staying on task. So daydreaming also has the benefit of fostering creativity. That's how I got into writing for some true crime and how I have my sketch pad right next to my desk because when I need a break, I pick up my sketch pad and I start sketching office um, waiting rooms and reception areas and just some things that I think would look better in a practice. Usually it's one I've just been to and I'm like, okay, well, then they need some help there. But you need to have a little bit of a creative outlet. You have incredible potential listeners and you can meet your goals. Don't let feelings of overload keep you burdened. Use these steps to hopefully lighten your load. Keep moving forward. So we definitely want to keep that for you. Okay, my personal tidbit this week comes from a funny question somebody asked me about. Uh, it was a good friend recently. He actually said, what is your favorite food? And I think we were talking about um, in, you know, general meals and things. And mine would be Eggs Benedict, but the eggs have to be perfect. And it's only from certain places. There's a place up in Napa called Boonfly Cafe that this has the best, best Eggs Benedict, hint of jalapeno. And from those of you that have been listening forever, you know I like things spicy. But what is there one thing that you cannot live without? For me, it would be chocolate chip cookies with no nuts. I eat at least one a week. I, I, it's a vice of mine. For some of you who have, you know, maybe you're a Dr. Pepper person or, you know, there's something you have to have. You know, I, I'm into my iced tea. But if there's something that I have to have, it's a really good chocolate chip cookie. No nuts in it. Those are gross. I don't mind... Um, 
What did somebody make me recently? Uh, peanut butter chocolate chip cookies. Those were actually pretty good. I know that's weird. Um, but that if you want to know a way to my heart, that would be it. A really good chocolate chip cookie, a high end glass of uh, Cabernet wine or a really great cup of tea. So I'm pretty easy to please pretty uh, low key, as you will, but I do like things that are that are good like that. So um, just send them on over. <laughs> so those are my thoughts today on this Terry Tuesday. And actually, I just got that uh, submitted for trademarking. So I know you probably think that's silly, but you have to trademark everything nowadays. So uh, hashtag Terry Tuesday is, is now I just got approval for trademarking it and putting it on a sweatshirt or a mug or whatever and being able to say it and use it for merchandise. So that was kind of a cool thing. So that's it for me today. Make it a great day. Make it a great week. And everyone, thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, Follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. Music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>